Good morning. I'm delighted to speak to you all uh, to launch this important report on how COVID-19 and the restrictions introduced to protect public health impacted on the lives of growing up in Ireland participants during 2020. The survey described in this report forms part of an invaluable research infrastructure which will help us understand the impact of COVID on children and young people now and for many years to come. This new report is based on a key findings report based on the survey completed by 12 year olds and their parents from the younger growing up in Ireland cohort and by young adults aged 22 years from the older cohort. Even without the pandemic and the restrictions introduced in order to protect public health, this is an important time in the lives of 12 year olds and 22 year olds. The younger ones are making the transition towards their teenage years and in many cases moving from primary to secondary school. The older ones are endeavouring to move on with their lives as young adults, either continuing with their education or training or starting out in the labour market. The past year has also been a demanding time for the parents of 12 year olds with disruptions to their own employment or working arrangements and the challenges of having to support home learning and schooling. As Minister, I'm keenly aware of the distinct value that growing up in Ireland offers as a national longitudinal study and why it was important for us to use this study to collect data about these events and their impact. Importantly, longitudinal research also allows us to systematically track ongoing or unforeseen events. So for example, the growing up in Ireland cohorts were younger, the study documented how each experienced the onset of the economic recession. Now, in face of the global pandemic, which has changed our lives in ways we could never really have imagined. Growing up in Ireland is exactly the kind of research we need to investigate the effects that this is having and will have on the lives of children, young people and their parents. Some of you will remember the publication last summer of a review of COVID-related national and international research carried out by the ESRI and my department. That review concluded that the emerging evidence up to that point suggested that pre-existing inequalities among children and young people people had grown in the wake of the pandemic and it highlighted the need to undertake a more systematic collection of evidence on, on its impact on young people and children. The report being launched today arises from my commitment to ensure that we address that need and we use the distinct opportunity offered by the Growing Up in Ireland data insofar as possible to understand the short and long-term impacts of COVID. Dr. Ashley Murray of the study team will take us through the detail of the report's findings shortly. The findings outline the participants' experience of COVID and how the pandemic restrictions have impacted on learning environments, on their level of physical activity and lifestyles, employment and income. Importantly, they also reveal how individuals are faring in terms of their mental health and their sense of well-being. And they highlight where experiences vary by gender and across socioeconomic groups, drawing attention to where the consequences of the pandemic are not the same for all of us. The research from the, the evidence from this research is crucial for my department, but it's also for the work of other departments and across government in addressing the impact of the restrictions and supporting people through this public health crisis. It emphasizes the ongoing need for us to continue to support educational engagement and well-being and address inequalities and help young people back into the labor market. Before we get to the presentation of the findings, I think it's really important for me to pay tribute to the extraordinary efforts of of the Growing Up in Ireland study team at the SRI who have conducted and completed this research so quickly. I know this was very much a joint effort across the team. I'm, I'm aware that the study team were already incredibly busy in 2020 keeping the GUI project on track and doing all of this in new and creative ways. So I'm really grateful to them uh, for, for all the additional work that they have done to, to undertake this special uh, COVID-19 report on the various cohorts. And finally, I want to give my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to the children, the young people and parents involved in growing up in Ireland who have stayed committed uh, to the study over so many years and have given so willingly of their, uh, their time. Before I finish, I'd really like to take the opportunity of today's event to mark the retirement at the end of this month of the co-principal investigator of Growing Up in Ireland, Professor Darty Watson of the Economic and Social Research Institute. Professor Watson's deep professional and personal commitment to Growing Up in Ireland has been an inspiration and very much appreciated by my own department. Her leadership of the study has imbued it with a scientific integrity and with excellence. And I'd like to express my own personal thanks to Professor Watson and on behalf of my department wish her well in the next chapter of her life.
I'm delighted that following two years of planning and working closely and collabor collaboratively with the Economic and Social Research Institute and the Central Statistics Office, we've developed an ambitious new model for the continued delivery of the study. This is a very exciting phase for growing up in Ireland which will consolidate the work of the project for the long term. I'm now delighted to launch this new report and I'm very happy to introduce Dr Ashling Murray to present the findings. Thank you to the Minister for his um, kind remarks. Um, I'm presenting today obviously on the, just the special COVID-19 survey that was part of the Growing Up in Ireland study. And my co-authors were Rebecca McClintock, Owen McNamara, Desmond O'Mahony, Emer Smith and Dorothy Watson. So a little bit about this special survey. So as you know, the Growing Up in Ireland cohorts have been running for over a decade. And in December 2020, we approached both of them and asked them to complete a short online survey specifically about their experiences of the COVID pandemic. And as you remember, in December 2020, um, that was kind of coming out of the restrictions of October, November and e anticipating an easing of restrictions in the run up to Christmas. And, and that will be important, I suppose, to remember that kind of context because things have been uh, obviously evolving rapidly even since December. So we went to both cohorts. In the older cohort, we asked the now 22 year olds, over 2000 of them um, completed the online survey for us. For cohort 08, we actually had two surveys, one for the 12 year old themselves and one from one of their parents. And we had over 3000 in each of those. We deliberately kept the surveys brief, so we were aiming for no more than 10 minutes and everybody completed online. And because this, the survey was short, we were focusing on just a core set of key experiences and outcomes relating to the disruption caused by the pandemic, um, but also a few questions on um, looking forward to the future. As I'm talking and during the survey, when we were talking about now for the participants, that was obviously December 2020, and we were usually asking them to either contrast uh, now, as in December, with either just before the pandemic started in March or during the initial school closure between March and May. The first results that we're sharing with you today are mostly cross-sectional descriptive, but future longitudinal analysis uh, will be possible because obviously we have a decade's worth of data leading uh, up to the pandemic. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue with both cohorts uh, after the pandemic as well. And just to note that the data that I'm presenting today are have been reweighted to be nationally representative. So as the minister said, this was a huge uh, team effort and I just want to kind of acknowledge all the people who made this possible. It was a, a very large survey to undertake in the scope of everybody working remotely and lots of other things going on. Um, the, foot, the survey along with the rest of the Growing Up in Ireland study is funded by the Irish government through the Department of Children and it's overseen by them and the Central Statistics Office. And the research is undertaken jointly by ourselves in the SRI and Trinity College Dublin. Because this was an online survey, we're very grateful to the Central Statistics Office for hosting it on their platform. And I also want to acknowledge the contribution of my other GUI colleagues, especially the data and operations team led by Amanda Quayle and Ethan Murphy in terms of preparing the data and getting it ready for myself and my co-authors to write up. But there was also a huge contribution from other people associated with the study, those on the Research Ethics Committee, the steering group, again, everybody working from home to get this um, off the ground and completed in a very short time frame. But of course, we wouldn't have a study or a survey at all if it wasn't for th the literally thousands of families and young adults around the country who participated in this special online survey uh, during a difficult time and also for their continued contribution to the study. So I think just to kind of, things have changed so rapidly, it's sometimes hard to keep track, but so just to kind of remind ourselves where the participants were in that run up to December. So we had the first case of COVID confirmed in Ireland in February. Uh, by March, we had the school closure in the middle of March and the stay at home order uh, by the end of March. That continued for a couple of months, but coming into the summer around June, there was uh, quite a bit of easing of restrictions. Uh, lots of things reopened. People were encouraged to uh, uh, vacate within, uh, take their vacations within Ireland. And in September, primary and secondary schools reopened for in-person teaching, although most of the colleges and, and workplaces would have remained uh, working from home. <clears throat> 
But by October, uh, we were back to national restrictions, uh, level three, the beginning of the month, level five by the end of the month. Then in December, there was a start of the easing of restrictions with more restriction easing expected over Christmas. And this is the, this is the time when the, uh, both cohorts were completing their survey for us. So this younger survey uh, opened in December 4th and the, the survey for 22 year olds a week later. They were asked to finish it before Christmas, so a very tight window for them um, to complete the online survey and the surveys were closed entirely by the end of the month. Okay, so on to some of the results. So the first thing that I'm going to share with you today are some trends in changes in activities. Okay, so in this graph, um, we're looking at the activities that both 12 year olds and 22 year olds said that they did more of uh, now as opposed to uh, what they would have normally done pre pandemic. Here and in other charts throughout this presentation, the yellow bars will indicate the 12 year olds and the blue bars indicate the 22 year olds. So we can see from uh, the graph here that time with family, talking to friends online or by phone, and informal screen time, both 12 year olds and 22 year olds tend to report they were doing this more than usual. But some activities decreased. So the activities that both cohorts did less of were meeting friends, and this was particularly noticeable for the 22 year olds. You can see there in the first pair of columns that 81% of 22 year olds said they were meeting their friends less than they normally would, compared to just under half of 12 year olds. And that might be due to the fact that the schools had reopened for in-person teaching for the younger cohort, but were largely remaining remote for the older cohort. We also saw that uh, both cohorts were doing less of a kind of cultural activity, so music and dance lessons, that kind of thing, particularly so for the younger cohort. And interestingly, both 12-year-olds uh, and 22-year-olds said that they were doing less sports and exercise than they normally would. Although it's also worth noting that a substantial minority, around 20% of both cohorts, actually said they did more sports and exercise than usual. So um, some differences in trends there. We also asked the 22-year-olds about changes in their smoking and drinking patterns. So looking at smoker or vapors first, so a minority of 22-year-olds said they were currently uh, using smoking or vaping. Uh, so, you know, thinking about a minority in the first place, but if we look at that uh, minority group and see whether their patterns of usage had changed, we can see in the darkest segment there of the pie chart that nearly 40% of current smoke that they were smoking or vaping, um, about 30% were doing less than usual and another 30% or so were about the same level as they normally would. When it came to drinking alcohol, so a greater proportion of 22 year olds said they were current users of alcohol, 87%. Uh, and among those in the darkest segment there, you can see um, just about 17% said they did it more than usual. Uh, but in the palest segment there, the largest segment, 60% uh, felt that they were actually drinking somewhat less than usual. Remote learning. So education obviously was one of the, the kind of key factors that was affected um, very early on in the pandemic with the move for in March to all kinds of learning from home. So we asked the 12 year olds and 22 year olds themselves about the sort of like the infrastructure that they had at home for engaging in remote learning. So this is again the 12 year olds in yellow and the 22 year olds who have been doing a course there in blue. So about, all, about half of the both cohorts reckoned that it was always true that they had a quiet place to study while they were home learning. In terms of access to a suitable computer, again, a majority said it was always true, although the 22 year olds were more likely to say it was always true they had access to a suitable computer. And the biggest difference between the two cohorts was whether it was always true that they had access to online classes. So 74% of the 22 year old students said that was always true for them compared to just 19% of 12 year olds. Here is when we see differences between families and in different income quintiles. So in this chart on the right here, I'm just comparing the responses uh, within the 12 year olds and that's the parents of the 12 year olds rather than the 12 year olds themselves. 
So you can see here for both the kind of areas of having a quiet place to study, adequate devices to connect to the internet and adequate internet connection. While nobody in either quintile has said it was always true <clears throat> in terms of everybody in the quintile, we can see there's still trends with the highest income there in the darker kind of mustard colored columns for each of those three uh, types of infrastructure, if you like, they were more likely to say that um, these were adequate or for in terms of the quiet place of study that it was always true for the child. Yeah, those in the lowest income quintile then, fewer of them uh, had these adequate resources. In thinking about schooling then, and then moving on to September with the return to school for 12 year olds, what's interesting given the timing of the pandemic in the life courses of, of this younger cohort, is that actually many of them were due to transition to secondary school when they went back in September. So about two thirds of them didn't actually go back to their primary school, they went back um, and started in a new secondary school. And using pink and purple here to contrast the children who went back to their primary school in September compared to those who started in secondary school in September 2020. And these are the kind of areas that they might have felt uh, difficulty in, sort of finding it hard to settle back or finding schoolwork more difficult. These are the always true responses. So you can see that uh, around about um, twi twice as many secondary school students found it, said it was always true they found it difficult compared to those who um, were in primary school. Now, there was quite a considerable amount of other people who said it was sometimes true, uh, but the patterns remain the same. So even if we were to conclude the sometimes true, not illustrated here, but you, can, you might be able to read it in small text, we still get the same trend. But switching over to the issue of whether teachers went over material to help them catch up, we can see here in the third pair of columns that the children who returned to primary school, and remember they would have been re returning to probably a single teacher classroom, that uh, they were more likely to say it was always true that the teachers had helped them um, to catch up with material when they went back in September, compared to just a third of those children who started in secondary school, remembering they would have had multiple teachers and, and probably new subjects as well. Again, if you were to add in the sometimes true, that would bring up sort of that majority of children saying it was at least sometimes true that teachers helped um, them to catch up by going over material. But what we see is also is that the primary school students were more likely to say that they felt safe from COVID-19 infection when they were in school. Half of those who went back to primary school in September reckoned that they felt they always felt safe from COVID infection compared to just a third of those who were starting in secondary school. So moving on then to what we know from their kind of contact with the disease itself. And again, remembering this is only up to December 2020. I'm going to kind of go through a few uh, headline results from the 12 year old cohort now on the left here in the, with the yellow highlights. So 10% of children said they had missed school because they had COVID-19 or its symptoms. And this is the child's own report. So it's not necessarily that they would have had, uh, all had a positive uh, test result. 3% of, the, of their parents who were completing the survey said they'd had COVID-19. 8% of the parents of 12 year olds said a family member had had COVID-19, but it wasn't necessarily somebody they, they lived with. 5% of parents said the 12 year old was uh, an individual who would be vulnerable to severe symptoms of COVID. And 23% of uh, 12 year olds lived with someone who was believed to be vulnerable to severe symptoms. Contrasting that then with uh, similar questions about the 22 year olds. So we had 4% of the 22 year olds themselves had had COVID-19 according to their own report. We didn't have a parent report for, for this older cohort. 15% of the 22 year olds said a family member or a close friend had had COVID-19. 8% of the young adults described themselves as vulnerable to severe symptoms. And considerably more, 39% said that they lived with someone who was vulnerable to severe symptoms. Another interesting aspect of the, I suppose the COVID-19 and young people was the debate about compliance with restrictions. So we asked the young people whether they thought their peers were compliant with the restrictions. So for 12 year olds here in the yellow pie chart, we asked them to whether it was always true, sometimes true or not true, that they didn't think their classmates took the disease seriously. So effectively the darkest segment, um, always true 
that's the percentage of 12 year olds who felt their peers weren't taking the COVID restrictions seriously. The 22 year olds, they were asked about whether they thought their friends took the disease seriously. They answered on a five point scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And again, the darkest segment of the pie chart here, this 8% strongly agree, they're the group that thought their friends really weren't taking the COVID restrictions seriously. But we can see that actually most people are sort of in that middle range of about sort of, um, sort of not, not saying that they strongly agree that the friends weren't taking it seriously and also um, not disagreeing that they weren't taking it seriously. So quite a lot of sort of middle ground for the compliance with, perceived compliance with restrictions. We also asked young people in both cohorts what they thought were the sort of important sources of information for, about COVID for them. So again, in this bar chart, the 12 year olds are in yellow and the 22 year olds are in blue. So we'll look first at if you like, the, effectively the people that were in their network and whether they thought they were important sources of information. So when it came to parents, you can see here on, on the far left this, um, that the 12 year olds, 80% of them said parents were an important source of information. And that compares to just a third of the older cohort of 22 year olds. The 12 year olds also seem more likely to say that school was an important source compared to college or work for the 22 year olds. But when it came to friends, um, the 22 year olds to seem to attach greater importance to information from friends than did the younger cohort. We also asked them about whether they thought effectively the media were important sources of information. So again, uh, 12 year olds in yellow, 22 year olds in blue. When it came to social media, just under a half of the older cohort thought it was an important source of information compared to just under a third of 12 year olds. Um, but for the 22 year olds, we can see that watching or reading the news was most often cited as an important source. Nearly 80% of them said the news was important. But even among the younger cohort, 60% of 12 year olds also thought that watching or reading the news was an important source of information. We also asked the, co the cohorts, 12 year olds and 22 year olds about their emotional well-being. So for 12 year olds, we used a measure called the uh, MHI-5 and using a, a particular threshold, we can summarize that about just over a fifth of 12 year olds were what we might call in a, the low mood range. 28% of girls were in the low mood range compared to 17% of boys. So it seems like that the girls were more likely to be in this low mood than were boys. And their parents also reported that 6% of them had missed out on needed mental health support because of the pandemic. But the children themselves, when we interviewed them in December, they, a lot of them were quite optimistic about the coming year. We asked them to rate how excited they were about next year, which is obviously 2021, on a scale of uh, one to 10, and uh, over a quarter of them gave the maximum 10 out of 10, so indicating that they, they, they were in fact really excited about the coming year. For 22 year olds, it was a little less positive. Um, we used a different measure, so we, we don't necessarily want to compare the 12 year olds and 22 year olds directly because they were, they were different measures for children and adults. <clears throat> but we did use a measure that we previously used when they were age 20, so we could compare with the pre-pandemic and hopefully in, in time post-pandemic levels. So using a measure called the CESD-8, um, we're actually putting nearly half of them in the low mood range. So that's uh, obviously a lot. And again, as we saw with the 12 year olds, the trend was for young women to be in, in the low mood range more often than the young men, although quite a large proportion of both genders were coming to that low mood range. 13% said they had missed out on needed mental health support because of the pandemic. And just 8% when asked to rate their current life satisfaction out of 10, gave it a top score of nine or 10 out of 10. So changes in employment. So here obviously we're just talking about the 22 year olds and the parents of 12 year olds. And we asked people if they had been employed just before or at any time since the pandemic. So thinking first about the 22 year olds here in shades of blue. So overall, just over three quarters of 22 year olds have been employed at some point. And when we asked them about sort of changes in their employment, you can see here in this largest 
segment here, the dark blue segment, nearly half of them said they had experienced losing their job or being temporarily laid off as, um, during the pandemic. So that's nearly half of, of, of 22 year olds who had a job at some point had, had lost that job effectively. You can also see here in the top columns of turquoise shade, 28% had experienced what, what was kind of we summarizing as another change in the nature of work. So that was things like um, the shift to remote working or maybe um, working as of a, a different type of job even in though they're still employed. So a lot of disruption there for um, the, um, employed young adults. You can contrast that with the experience for the parents then of 12 year olds. So I have parent one on the left and parent two on the right. So the parent one was the, the parent who completed the survey for us and that was mostly the mother. Parent two, um, that was just, their employment situation was also supplied by um, the, just the one parent who completed the survey. Uh, but just to note as well, the, most of the parent twos were actually fathers. So in terms of parent one, we can see that 70% of them were employed either just before or since the pandemic started. Uh, and in the darker shade here, the, the brown shade here, 22% of those parent one lost their job or were temporarily laid off. Similarly for parent two in this darkest brown shade here, 19% of those who had been employed had experienced loss of a job or being temporarily laid off. So you know, quite a substantial proportion, but much um, less than the half of young adults who had a similar experience. We see for the biggest change for that parent one, mostly mothers, was this kind of 47% here at the top of the column who said they had experienced another change in the nature of work. And again, a lot of that was the shift to remote working. So we did ask them also to look forward to the future and whether they were optimistic about the future. The ants, everybody, uh, the adults in the parents of 12 year olds and also the 22 year olds they answered on a five point scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree that they were optimistic about the future. And I'm gonna show you then just now in the, the charts that come up, the percentage who strongly agreed or agreed that they were optimistic. So the parent, <coughs> the 72% of the 22 year olds here in the circle with the dark blue ring, they strongly agreed or agreed that they were optimistic about the future. The parents of 12 year olds were somewhat more optimistic about the future for their child. So 88% of them strongly agreed or agreed that they were optimistic about the 12 year olds future. Well, the parents, they were somewhat less optimistic when it came to their own future, just 72% uh, said so they were uh, optimistic about their own future. Although obviously that's still the majority of the parents who completed the survey. So well, some conclusions then. So there's a lot in this report and I've only given you a sort, of, a sort of a flavor of the results that are in the published report. But I think what comes out of it is that the pandemic obviously was primarily a public health emergency, but it was also a, a disruption in other areas of the lives of children, families and young adults. So for example, in the area of education, we can see that over half of 12 year olds and 22 year old students report difficulties with remote learning. 10% of 12 year olds have missed school because they'd had COVID or its symptoms. And 23% of, of 22 year old students have missed out on work experience or an internship because of the pandemic. In health, uh, apart from the COVID effects directly, we can see that 10% um, of 12 year olds had missed out on necessary dental care. 13% of 22 year olds felt they'd missed out on mental health support and nearly 40% of both cohorts have said they were doing less sports and exercise than they normally would have. There are also changes in employment as we've just seen with about half of 22 year olds and about a fifth of parents who were in employment are losing their job or being temporarily laid off and nearly half of all employed mothers had some change to the nature of work. So a lot of that was the shift to remote working and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. And it is worth thinking about some of the more positive aspects of, of the experiences that people reported. So for some individuals and families, and by no means all, there were positive changes in lifestyle, such as getting to spend more time with their family. Um, some students found that there were benefits to studying, working from home. And we saw that while smoking and drinking increased for some young adults, others actually reported doing it less often. And for us in growing up in Ireland, it's important to 
we felt it was really important to capture this contemporary experience because it will be important not just in these you know, sort of short term results, but also to understanding their outcomes and trajectories over the medium and longer term. Um, given that this is a longitudinal study uh, and we are privileged to have had so many families working with us for over a decade now at this stage. Okay, so I'm going to finish there.